you're welcome. We are very happy to have you. Today, Pastor Dan, not Pastor Dan, his doctor, but he's also a spiritual leader, I guess I can call him uh, uh, pastor, but he's not pastor, he's a doctor, he's a lecturer at Makerere. He'll be speaking to us about listening as part of as, uh, a leader's weapon, listening a, a leader's great weapon in times of conflict. I put it in the chat, his topic, and I don't know if we want to stick to that or change it. So we'll give him a, a few minutes as we settle down. But today I wanted to remind us where we have come from. And because we have a few new people, I thought we would, um, I would run through where we have come through and what we are trying to accomplish as a group. But we started this group two years ago in June during COVID because that was the easiest way of gathering people. And my heart has always been to develop leaders, but also the people I meet here in the US, I always think of how can I share what I see here with the people there, with the people back home, especially the, the church, the local church. I am a, a trained pastor, though I don't have a church. I actually lead a nonprofit called Empowering Nations. I'm a, I also have a day job. I work as an accountant. Though my background is in law, I am a lawyer by training. I also have a postgraduate in HR. So I, be, I worked as an HR for three years. So I, I, I have my hands in so many different fields. But above all, my heart is always for the local church. Because I believe as long as the local church is empowered, then we are fulfilling the great commission, which is go to the ends of the world, making disciples. So every person who especially is my friend or my teacher who has the heart of God or the local church, I always run to them and ask them, can you come and share about your experience, your work with Christ with my friends in East Africa? So Dr. E was my teacher. Yeah, about your experience. Right. And um, Peter was, of course, in his class too. You have uh, Dr. Becky was in the same school. You have seen some of the people who have come through. Those are some of the people I've met on this side that I've always gone back to and said, please help me share your knowledge, your experience, with especially the, the leaders that I know of, which we now is this group. So we've been meeting every Thursday around this time for the last two years. We've gone through especially leadership classes and spiritual formation. But my heart or my burden is always to make sure that the leaders are trained. Because remember what Maxwell, John Maxwell is a pastor, but he's also a leadership expert here. He was for so many years as a pastor, but transitioned into leadership development and has been training all over the world. But he, he was asked his best definition of leadership and he said, number one, leadership is influence. You can know that you're a leader if you, are, you have anyone you're influencing, starting with yourself. And it has been found that even one person will in their lifetime influence more than 10,000 people without working on it. Whether you say it or don't say it, you will influence as an individual more than 10,000 people in your lifetime. But also we have always said it on this platform that leadership starts with ourselves. You are a leader, not to a group or to a church only, but to yourself. So everyone is a leader in their own capacity. So my burden, for especially Africa, as we compare ourselves with the developed countries, is to work on our leadership capacity, our leaders. When Obama visited Africa, when he was still uh, uh, president, he was asked about ways Africa can be developed. 
And he also pointed to one need, which was developing the leaders in Africa. Africa, or Dr. Obama said that the future of Africa is up to Africans. It's not up to the Western world. Some of us who are in the Western world, we can tell you that the West has its own problems. I don't think that they are, have Africa as their priority. Maybe they want to come and take the resources that we have, human labor or minerals, but they are not going to stay to develop Africans so that we can also develop our continent. So the future of Africa is up to us, the Africans. And the only way we can improve the future of the church or of the continent or of the country is to develop the leadership potential that we have. So that is my burden. We are starting this maybe as a small group, but I'm hoping that whatever you hear here or whatever you learn, you can share it, whether it's with yourself or with one person. Imagine if you influence 10,000 people, you as an individual without even working hard on it, just the people you come, who come through your life. Imagine now if you are a pastor, the 10,000 will be multiplied by the number of people in your church. So we are making influence and it doesn't have to, Jesus changed the world with only 12 people and we are more than 12 on this platform. So I don't want us to underlook our potential, but I want us every time we gather to pay attention and to take every, whether small or big principle that we learn, even from especially now all these Muslims that have visited us, everything they're teaching us, what they've learned over the years, and try to either implement it in our cell group, in our church, in our lives. And that's how we make influence. So the future of Africa, the future of your church is up to you by what example you're going to, to show to your group. And do not underestimate the potential that God has put in you. God calls us gods. Remember the Bible, we are called gods. And he, the Bible says, I've made you of my yes. instrument of war. I don't know why like, uh, that scripture, maybe Timothy can pull it. He says, you're my instrument of war. God uses you in his hand to change the world. So if you're a pastor here and you have more than 12 people in your church, you have the capacity to change the world. Because the Holy Spirit is here. Jesus is backing you. And Jesus already did it. So that is my encouragement. But I also wanted to, please mute yourself if you're unmuted. I wanted to remind us of why we meet. My job as, as one person on this side of the world is to bring to you all the people, all the resources, all the good people that I meet and their knowledge. And God has helped us these two years, has connected us to great people. But your responsibility too is invite as many people as you can, but also in our humble way, take whatever you are learning and run with it. Because the future depends on you, the future of the church, the future, your own future, the future of even the global church, as we know it. We've had an advantage now. Dennis is in, the, is in Turkey. God can use him to change that country. We've had people here from Kenya. We've had people here from South Africa. We've had people from Rwanda and Tanzania. Of course, Uganda, you're the majority. The scripture I was talking about is in the chat. Uh, Timothy, thank you. People who have come through, we've had people from South Africa, uh, Derek, uh, Craig and Dale, who have taught us about the money map and farming God's way, they're down south. Actually, Craig just moved to South Africa, from Namibia to South Africa, and is coming back to teach us. We've taught things like, of course, God, uh, farming God's way, the money, uh, there's, there's a plane flying over me. 
we are near the airport. If you if you can hear the noise, we've told. This is the second time we are doing uh, healing the leader's heart. So it's a season number two because when we did it last year, people were so blessed, but they also had questions. So we decided to redo it. So we are calling it season number two. So if you're here and you haven't subscribed to our YouTube, Timothy, if you can put the link there, please subscribe because every topic we've shared in the past, Timothy has been uh, very helpful. He makes it into a clean clip and puts it on YouTube and Facebook. So please subscribe to Empowering Nations, Facebook and YouTube for you to be able to, to see. I think he has put the link there. If you can, you can go in directly and, and subscribe there. Oh, everything we've done in the past, even if you're just new to this, uh, this group, you will find them there. Okay, ask me a question. That's a big uh, uh, introduction. Please ask me a question before we let Dan start at some point. Then when you're ready, please just put on your camera. That's the sign for me that you're ready. Thank you for saying thank you. Those who are saying thank you. You know, when we started, there were people were telling me, Judy, that cannot work. You cannot have a class on WhatsApp. People will abuse it. If you bring Muzungu, especially in the picture, people will ask them for money. They will take their contacts and abuse them. But I would want to thank you because even if it has not been easy, we've had some hiccups, but generally this has worked for us. Dr. E and Peter, they've been here almost every day. I mean, every week. Only that today we gave Dr. E a break and Peter is healing from heart surgery. But I want to thank you for being disciplined for not ashaming us as Africans, asking for money and asking. Uh, one, one friend, Mzungu, so, showed me a list from a pastor. The pastor sent him a list of what the things he wanted. And they were, I need a car, I need a fridge, I need build me a house, buy me land. And this Mzungu himself, you know, people here have mortgages. They don't have land themselves. Uh, everything they use is, is on the lawn. So the person was shocked because it's like, I also don't have these things. I have to pay for them every month. But it is not true that uh, everyone who is an Amer American or is white has a lot of money. Get it from me. I've been here for more than 10 years. They work very hard. And they have a lot of debt. So I think it's better that you, you believe God or we believe God for provision. And God sometimes can use anyone in spite of who they are or where they are. So, but I want to thank you for being disciplined and keeping uh, the commitment. I know you have to spend your data to, to every week. You have to spend your with your money to be able to attend and you have done that faithfully for more than two years so thank you for that and i know god is going to to bless you for for what you're investing in if you don't want to invest in knowledge of course you're investing in ignorance in the reverse but thank you for doing that so ask me a question i'll give you a minute please ask me a question uh, praise the Lord, Pastor Judith, and everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis Hamala Armstrong. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very much uh, grateful for this opportunity to be part of this uh, movement. Mm -hmm. I usually don't want to call this a class. I usually call this as, as church. Mm -hmm. uh, Pastor Judith, uh, when we were starting last year, mm -hmm. there was... Uh, a view that we would get certificates after the training. I don't know whether I didn't hear it well, all the certificates were issued out and I missed out. I beg to be 
brought to speed as of my uh, concern. Thank you so very much. Yeah, everyone who needs a certificate, it's a very simple thing for us to do. But at the same time, we want to make sure it's value for money. We don't want to give you a certificate when you just attended one time. Or give you a certificate when you come late every day. It doesn't mean anything. I'm not saying that's what you did, Dennis, but if you need a certificate for the classes we have offered, please let me know. It's, uh, we have a media team, world class media team. We have a lady here and Timothy there who work on our media issues. They can give you a certificate whenever you need it. But however, when you ask for a certificate, make sure you really deserve it. Make sure you have learned, you have learned anything or something because we do not want to undervalue our certificates. We are, we are an, a legally recognized nonprofit in the US. So you can use your certificate for whatever you want to use it for. So I can promise you that that holds you, it holds value. And me as the leader of the nonprofit, I can back it up with whatever you want me to back it up with. But make, me, make sure you don't make me guilty from giving you a certificate you didn't work for. So save me that burden. Otherwise, please ask for. Someone is laughing so hard, Pastor Jackson. It's OK, we, we try to keep these classes relaxed because it's evening for you people. You've been working the whole day. We don't want to come and say, please repeat this whole chapter of a book. We want this to be adult learning, like a, a, as I don't want to call it a seminar or anything. We want you to learn, but in a very relaxed way, because we are all adults. We have kids, we have homes, we have work. We don't want to, again, put you through the tension you've gone through the whole day. But it doesn't mean that we are not serious about what we are saying. That's the doctor, so I, that's my sign that I should stop talking. I wanted to introduce a few people. If you see Brother Dutch, he's on the board of Empowering Nations. So if I do anything wrong, please call him and report me. He's on the call. And if you see uh, Dr. Dan, the one who is our speaker today, if I misbehave, please call him and tell him Judaism is misbehaving. And some other people are in hiding. Uh, I want to make the, they ask to that they stay in hiding, so I want to mention their names. Uh, but they are watching me, so uh, please feel free to, to let them know how I'm doing. However, I wanted today to thank you. Thank you for being a good group. Thank you for also encouraging me to keep sourcing for, for teachers, for resources. They are, we have a good lineup coming, new people that God is just bringing our way. When I started, I didn't know where we were going with this. But God has been bringing more people our way. And when God wants to develop you or grow what you're doing, he brings people to you. And that's what God has done. Okay, Dr. Dan. Can't hear you, but maybe some volume. Volume, but yeah, you're muted. Testing, testing. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear All you right. from the other gadget. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, Judith. Uh, thank you for having me here this morning, this evening. I was going to say morning. Clearly, the day has come to an end. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't come at exactly eight. Uh, for those of you who have honored my invitation, because I was concluding uh, another meeting uh, somewhere else. But thank you, thank you so much for coming through and for being part of this. Uh, let us just pray uh, together. Almighty God, I thank you for the chance to delve into your word once again. I thank you for your love. 
I thank you for your kindness. Be with us, O oh God, as we learn together uh, on healing the leader's heart in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So welcome uh, once again uh, to this amazing ministry. Um, I, I tend to find it very difficult to run away uh, from uh, from Judith. She has a way of getting you to do things. Uh, and we, we praise the Lord uh, for that. We praise the Lord for that and for the things that he's doing. It's good to see the numbers that are here and not take anything uh, for granted um, because there is always a conflicting uh, program. People want to eat, sleep, and do other things. So thank you so much uh, for joining uh, the call uh, this evening. So I'm going to talk about specifically listening, uh, listening as a great tool in uh, conflict uh, resolution, uh, listening as the tool that we use. And as I was meditating again about the word listening, I thought maybe I would even take it a notch higher and talk about um, emotional intelligence as a wider concept, emotional intelligence, and then how listening comes in as part of emotional intelligence uh, in the whole uh, discussion uh, regarding listening and regarding the leader's great weapon in times of conflict. So most times we think about conflict in different ways. We think about conflict uh, as war, you know, Russia versus Ukraine. Um, you think about uh, rebels attacking a city. And oftentimes we may not realize that conflict is part and parcel of each and everything that we do each and every day. Um, conflict is, is really what is with us most of the time. For those of us who have been raised in families and we have seen, um, we, most of us who've been raised in families, not as single children, but as part of uh, a, at least two or more children in a home, you have learned that being in conflict is almost inevitable. There will be always somebody who has a different view about something there'll be someone complaining that who finished the sugar who ate my my middle part of the bread and and all these other things that keep on coming uh where are my shoes i, I have kids uh god has blessed us with, with, with children so it's very interesting to hear someone saying don't shout at me oh i'm not shouting you're the one who's shouting and so on and so forth there is always something uh, that is that is a conflict created uh, issue in a, uh, in a family, and and actually it has been said by some authors that if you are not raised in a family, um, if you've not been raised with fellow siblings, you tend to lose out on how to resolve a uh, conflict. So today I'd like us to to have that at the back of our minds, you know. Um, one of the stories that always intrigues me was the Ugandan former Prime Minister, Amama Mbabazi. At some point in time, there was a scandal in quotation marks, which was being, uh, uh, you know, the scandal was happening about the purchase or sale of land. And he kept his cool. He kept a smile on. He kept his cool. He never went on to mid, uh, media, social media, blasting this one, blasting the other. He kept his cool until this matter uh, just found a place in time and it just calmed down. And I was like, this is an amazing, amazing thing. I even wrote about it in my book. Uh, we don't teach you this at the university when I was talking about emotional intelligence. So what is emotional intelligence, therefore? Emotional intelligence is the ability to control your emotions and the emotions of those around you. The ability to control your emotions and the emotions of those around you. Mm -hmm. The intelligence, the wire, the ability, the wisdom to be able to calm down situations that would otherwise escalate into something that you would later on uh, regret. 
That is emotional intelligence. And there are so many examples of how we need emotional intelligence and why we need it. You probably heard of wives and husbands who've killed each other, maimed each other, damaged each other for life uh, in what we call crimes of passion. You found your husband or your wife in a compromising situation with another individual and you get a knife and hack them to death. You get a, a club and bludgeon them, uh, causing either total damage uh, or huge, huge, huge scarring uh, to the individual because of the inability to control the emotions that have been uh, erupted at that time. Uh, in law, we have uh, the defense of self-defense, which is a defense of, uh, not, not self-defense, provocation. I was provoked to do something, you know, but that defense is not normally provided for soldiers, at least in the movies that I have watched, because a soldier is supposed to be an individual who can control or who should be able to control his or her emotions. So let us read together from the book of um, First Samuel chapter 25. First Samuel chapter 25, I don't know, Pastor Judith, who the, the passionate readers are in of this group. Uh, do we have like those people who read passionately? It would be good to have someone read with me. Uh, First Samuel chapter 25, preferably, preferably from the New King James Version. Preferably from the New King James Version. Is there anybody here who would like to read some of the scripture uh, in First Samuel uh, chapter 25? Uh, I will not ask us to stand because we are in a unique space. <laughs> yes. All right. Anyone? The whole of the chapter or you just... I, I will tell you where to stop. Okay, I'm trying not to be the one to. I like Kato. Uh, are you able to read for us, Pastor? Send them. Okay. Yes. Please do. From verse one. From verse one. And the rest of us, please listen intently. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were, were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in a mound whose possessions were in camel, and the man was very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in camel. Now the name of the man was Nabath. And the name of his wife, Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful con con countenance, but the man was <coughs> callish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. Please and then stop we heard there. in the wilderness Please that nobody there. did not share. Saint Amu, if yes. you would stop there. I would want us to read from New King James Version. Uh, let, us, let us go back to verse 3. I see someone has helped us and put it there. Verse 3, what does it say? Verse 3, uh, Timothy, yes. It says, the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance. But the man was harsh and evil in his doings, okay? Harsh and evil in his doings. And, and what does it say doings. there? He was of the house of Caleb. So we are introduced to two characters immediately in First Samuel verse, chapter 25, verse 3. The first one, of course, is Samuel has died. David has gone to the wilderness in Paran. He's running away from Saul. Um, and then we have, uh, we have, uh, what's his name? We have um, a man called N N Nabal, uh, or Nebo, and his wife, Abigail. 
Okay? His wife, Abigail. Now, take notes. The, the other versions say that Abigail was discerning and beautiful. Abigail was discerning and beautiful. This version here says that Abigail was intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was sally and mean in his dealings. Uh, please go back to uh, NKJV. Uh, um, okay, here, here it says, go back, go back, go back to message. Message says, go back to message. Message, Nabal, his name was Fool, was a Calebite, and his wife's name was Abigail. The woman was intelligent and good looking. The man was brutish and mean. Brutish and mean. Okay, please take note of that because we are going to study together. Now, verse 4. Verse 4 then says, And David had uh, David out in the back country. Okay, when David had. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was sharing his sheep, continue, he sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. So we see now the third individual coming back, that is David, and he is being introduced and telling the young men, the young messengers, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. Continue. And that you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. You see, David is saying that Nabal lives in prosperity. Okay, continue, verse 7. Now, I have heard that you have shearers. Your shepherds were with us. And we did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Camel. Very quickly, ask your young men, they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son, David. David had over 400 men with him. He had over 400 men with him. Nabal had 3,000 sheep, according to verse 2, and 1,000 goats. He was a wealthy man. And when they are shearing, that is when you find uh, they are cutting, they, they are slaughtering goats, they are feasting, and so on and so forth. All right? So David says in verse 8, please ask your young men. They will tell you that we have treated them very well. Okay? Now, when they get to Nabal, Nabal answers in verse 10, and say, who is this David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each one from his master. Shall I take my bread and my water, and my flesh that I've killed for my sharers, and give it to men whom I know not where they come from? That is in verse 11. So David, his young men are uh, turn their way, and they go. And they tell David all that has been said. So immediately we see Nabal the fool brings out his foolery by ignoring the fact that his sheep have survived because of David. His sheep have survived because of David. His young men have been treated well. He treats them poorly and his young men turn on their heels, that is they turn around and go back and tell David all these words. Now, the first thing I want you to notice, the men of David did not, did not try to blend the words or present them better or whatever. They just threw them at David the way they had come. Take note of that. Because one of the leadership lessons is, how do you deliver a message? As a result of what they said, verse 13 says, and David said to his men, Every man guard on your sword, or your sword. So every man guarded on his sword, and David also guarded on his sword, and about 400 men went. 400 men went with David. Okay? And what was David's plan? David's plan was to ensure that these men 
and him kill off whoever it was that was there. David said unto his men, Guard on every man your sword, and they guarded on every man his sword. And David also guarded on his sword, and they went up after David about 400 men and 200 aboard by the staff. Okay? It continues. Our, our, our person who was uh, sharing the scripture has stopped. I wish he could continue. But one, now listen. Uh huh. Yes, 200 stayed with the supplies. Okay, let's go to verse 14. It says, But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, or Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. The, my King James Version says, He railed them. Okay? But the men were very good to us, and we are not hurt, neither did we miss anything, as long as we are conversant with them when we are in the field. So he's telling the, the, the lady that we were looked after by these men very well. Continue, New King James Version, verse 16. What does it say? They were a wall to us both by night and day. All the time we were with them, keeping the sheep. Go ahead. Now, therefore, know and consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a scoundrel that one cannot speak to him. Nabal is being testified about by his own servant that he is such a scoundrel. The other version said that he is a fool. No one can speak to him. So the servant moves from, 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 from um, listening to what Nabal has said and goes to the wife and says, Abigail, madam, help us. Now see the action that, that Abigail takes. As soon as, verse 18, as it says, then Abigail made haste. Your versions may tell you something else. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five shears of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, I love raisins, and 200 cakes of figs and loaded them onto donkeys. The power of listening. Abigail immediately sensing the action, sensing what is going to happen to befall. She did not waste time making herself beautiful. She did not make waste time uh, applying makeup and, 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 and seeking consent from her husband. She immediately knew that there was danger. Her servant had spoken to her. Two things come out. One, he must have been a trusted servant. By the time he came to Abigail, in verse 17 and says now therefore know and consider what you will do for harm is determined against our master and against all his household the power of listening remember verse 2 we were told was it verse 2 or verse 3 that abigail was a woman of good understanding and beautiful countenance a woman who was discerning who was wise who was beautiful she immediately gets into action now i want you to now listen to what abigail does from verse um 19 it says and she said to her servants go on before me see i am coming after you but she did not tell her husband Nebo. verse 20 verse 20 so it was as she rode on the donkey that she went down under cover of the hill and there were David and his men coming down towards her and she met them. Abigail was a woman who knew how to do peace missions. The way the Ugandan team led by my OB, Honorable Ruhakana Rugunda, is doing in Russia with Ukraine. She knew that she had to step her game very quickly. She has sensed the conflict 
and she has realized I must act quickly. I must apply wisdom, emotional intelligence. Having listened to what the issue is, do not deal with that. Act quickly. She doesn't tell her husband, verse 19, she immediately gets into the, the frame. Let's continue, verse 20, 21. Verse 21. Now David had said, surely in vain I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him, and he has repaid me evil for good. Verse 21. Verse 22. What does it say? Verse 22. May God do so and more also to the enemies of David, if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. David had passed a death sentence. Now, when Abigail saw David, she dismounted and quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David and bowed to the, down to the ground. This wasn't even her husband, but she already knew the anointing on David's life. She was acting in wisdom. She has already prepared food. She has made the food go before her. The same way that their ancestor, Jacob, had sent food to Esau before meeting Esau. Abigail now starts applying what you and I must apply whenever we are in a conflict place. Take on a position of humility. Yes, you have been hurt. Sometimes you are the one who has had take on a position of humility. Abigail knew that as a wife to Nebo, herself, her husband, all their property, we are not going to survive David's sword. Indeed, God even testified about David later on and said that you are covered with blood. So in verse 24, she says, she falls at his feet and says, on me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. Can you imagine? And please let your maid servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maid servant. She does not blame shift. You get it? She doesn't shift the blame and say, it's my husband, deal with him. No, 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 no. She says, on me. On who? On me. Please, let not my Lord regard this scoundrel, Nabal. She's talking about her husband and calling him a scoundrel. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maid servant, did not see the young man of my Lord whom you sent. Meditate upon those words, my brothers, my sisters. See how she makes her case. For those of you who are lawyers, you can see. She says in verse 24, on me. She takes on the blame. On me, my Lord, on me. Can you get the TPT? The, uh, the, 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 the passion translation, TPT, if you can, the passion translation, and see what it says. TPT, if you can get it. To see how it is said in the passion translation. Or, or, or the amplified version, if you have the amplified version. You can share it with that. But the point is that here you can see Abigail is wise. She takes on the blame. Why? She's resolving a conflict. She's not even the aggressor. Amplified says, please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal, fool, is his name. And foolishness, stupidity, is with him. But I, your maid servant, did not see the Lord's young men whom you sent. Go back to verse 24. Let's see what Amp says. Kneeling at his feet, she said, My Lord, let the blame and guilt be on me alone. And please let your maid servant speak to you and listen to the words of your maid servant. Whenever we are in conflict, even when you are not the one, but you see a position where you can resolve conflict, this is how we are supposed to act. This is how we are supposed to act. Hallelujah. So let us go now to verse 20, uh, verse 20, uh, verse 26. What does verse 26 say? Now, my Lord, now, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, 
Since the Lord has prevented you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as self-destructive as Nabal. Let them be as self-destructive as Nabal. She already passes the judgment upon her own husband. Let them be as self-destructive. Let's continue. I want you to listen to what she says. I have verse 27. Now this gift which your maid servant has brought hmm, never got to resolve conflict without a gift. This gift which your maid servant has brought my Lord, let it be given to the young men who accompany and follow my Lord. Let it be. Please forgive the transgression of your maid servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a secure and enduring house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil will not be found in you. All your days. She's basically saying, do not kill this man. Do not kill this man. Let's continue. Verse 29. Verse 29. Should anyone rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, then the life of the of, of, of my Lord will be bound in the precious bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies, those he will hurl out as from the center of a sling. Verse 30. And it will happen when the Lord does for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken or promised concerning you and appoints you ruler over Israel. See what she says? Verse 31. Verse 31. That this incident will not cause grief or bring a troubled conscience to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord having avenged himself when the Lord deals well with my Lord. Then remember with favor your maid servant. Now I want you to go back to, to New King James Version for this, uh, this part, verse 31. It says, remember your maid servant. When you, when, uh, but when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maid servant. She's basically saying, she's even pleading her own case, saying, man, you cannot remember me when God has elevated you. Remember me when God has elevated you. And indeed, when you continue to read on the scripture, it shows that when David accepts the gifts, he accepts the gift, says, thank you very much. I was going to shed blood. Now I've not shed blood, surely. Verse 32. Let's go to verse 32 and see what he says. Verse 32. Then David said to Abigail, blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Uh-huh. Continue. And blessed is your advice. And blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. Continue. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried. Have you heard that? Unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light, no males would have been left to Nabal. No males would have been left. He had vowed already that he was going to clear the whole of Nabal and probably take all his sheep and, and goats. But Abigail acted quickly. So when we're talking about the leader's heart, many times our leaders get hurt. But there are lessons that we learn from this scripture, the scriptures we have read. First of all, which type of servant are you? Are you the kind of servant who is like David's men? As soon as they were shoved off, they just went and retorted the message that that um, that he had given them. Is that all that you do? Or can you be like the servant of Abigail, realizing a mistake has been done, quickly running and saying, I need to do something about this. Let me not be in a mess. Let's quickly 
run and get intervention. Let's not waste an opportunity and approaches the maid server, the approaches uh, Abigail, and Abigail reacts very quickly. You can see the role of servants, the role of employees, how they behave. One group just says nothing, just says bad, this is what they did to us. The other one says, my dear, I must run quickly and seek intervention. Oh, are in the position of being an assistant, a deputy to somebody? Are you in the position whereby you can do something about a scenario? Are you in that position? And can you do something about it? For Abigail, having realized the challenge that they were facing imminent danger, did not waste time. She immediately ran and sought intervention. She immediately ran. Why? She knew who Hanabal was. She knew the kind of husband was. She knew that he was a fool. But she sought intervention quickly, maybe not for the husband, but also for the husband. Because she saved the husband's life. Indeed, the scripture says that when she went back, she found the husband drinking and celebrating and making merry and left him to enjoy himself for the rest of the day or the rest of the evening. Until the next day, you can read for us that portion. You can bring it out, uh, verse 35, 36 there. She left him alone. Having averted danger, do not seek the first thing to see. You see how I have saved you? No. Why? Because you are using certain weapons that are going to help not only save you, but save everyone. So David tells her to go up in peace to her house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. Uh -huh, verse 36 says, Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was, holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king, and Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. Therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. When she told him in the morning, verse 37, he was in so much shock. He suddenly realizes, my goodness, I would have been dead. His heart died within him and he became like a stone. He probably got a heart attack. And this heart attack, within 10 days, he was gone. And indeed, when he was gone, David celebrated, oh, thank God, I'm not the one who killed him. And immediately he sent messages to Abigail. In verse around verse 39, can you go to 39 40? He sends messages to Abigail after Annabal has 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 uh, has, uh, has died. And in verse 39, we see here David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife. And in verse 40, she immediately agrees. She immediately agrees. So she did not even really suffer much uh, as a as a widow, you know. By, by verse 41, she said, Here is your maid servant, a, serv a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. And in verse 42, what does it say? Verse 42, uh, she rose in haste. She doesn't waste time, this woman. She rose in what? In haste and said, I'm not missing this chance of getting a good husband. Who is going to be a king anyway? rode on a donkey, attended by five of her maidens, and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. We don't know what happened to the property of Nabal. You can see this kind of woman. She valued property less than relationship. She had already seen David is going in certain places, remember me, because she knew that her deliverance from a foolish husband is about to come. So what are we learning from that? One, what is your reaction? You must be able to control the emotions of yourself and the emotions of others. That is why Abigail was able to quickly run to David in around verse 18 and immediately tell him, don't mind this fool. My husband Nabal, or Nabal, is a fool. Don't mind him, because even his name tells you the kind of person he is. 
Or are you the kind of person who waits and says, ah, huh? let me wait for how things are going to be. Let people destroy themselves. Because Abigail, a part of me feels like she was like Jesus. Immediately running from imminent danger from sin and laying herself. Uh, what does the scripture say? In verse, uh, the, the verse that talks about when she says, on me, my Lord, verse 24. On me, my Lord, let it be on me. She takes on the blame and intercedes on behalf of her husband, intercedes on behalf of her servants. All the males had been doomed to die. All the property had been doomed to die. That was Abigail's, uh, uh, Abigail's um, intervention. Nabal, on the other hand, yes, you can see there. Nabal, on the other hand, reported, retorted badly. Many times when people have sinned, when we abuse our leaders, when we do certain things to our leaders, we miss out. Nabal did not care. He knew who David was. He knew the kind of person David was. He knew that David was protecting his sheep. But at a time when he was supposed to pay back or to pay something, because David is saying, please, I have looked after your, your sheep. Help my young men. Give them something to eat of the abundance that you have. David hardly had 500 people. Nabal had over 3,000 sheep, enough for him to eat and enough for the David to also feast upon. What does that teach you? Be careful when you're in a position of privilege, when you're in a position of authority, not to just say anything anyhow. Have the emotional intelligence. Listen to what people are telling you. Hear the cry. Don't be so dismissive of people immediately. Hear the holistic picture before you make a decision. Hear the holistic picture. Make sure that your response is the response that is needed for that season at that point in time. That it is the right response that you need to give in that season. All right? Now, when she says, on me, my Lord, on me, she then makes an intercession. Because clearly, David had become angry and was just going to execute people and leave a bloodbath. That's what David was going to do. And it is like sin. God's judgment on us was going to be just death. At that point, Jesus comes in and saves us from this imminent death that we would have suffered. I know we are talking about leaders. When your leader is going to make a big mistake, what do you do about it? Do you watch him or you immediately go to act and save him? So your response is very key. Your response is very key. Okay. Now that you know what emotional intelligence is, how then do we listen and listen attentively and actively? I was doing some research. And one of the ways to listen is by giving undivided attention. When someone is speaking to you, one of the things I am learning, uh, and sometimes I forget and I have to remind myself, that you can't listen when you're doing a million other things. That's not listening. And someone feels disconnected, especially when you're in a position of leadership. Be careful. As I speak to you, I also speak to myself. Number two, show by your body language that you are actually interested in what someone is saying. Today I was on TV. I, I, I had a, I was advertising, I was doing an advert for for the for my, my school. We are going back for a careers day tomorrow, and then we have an AGM. And they are saying that position yourself such that the camera can capture you properly. Let your body language show that you're communicating to the audience. Let your body language show that you're interested in what someone is saying. Number three, provide appropriate feedback. Sometimes it's about seeking clarity. I was watching a, a, a clip, a, a clip of a comedy kind of comedy kind of sitcom with my wife, whereby the wife was asking the husband, I just want you to listen to me, you know? Don't give me suggestions and whatnot. If I want suggestions, I can get a suggestion box, but right now I just want you 
to listen. The other thing I have learned as a married man is defer judgment or defer the giving of advice. Oh, on that situation, do like this. Now do like this. Because you'll be frustrated. Your wife even doesn't want advice. She just wants someone to listen. Sometimes your leaders do not want your advice. They just want to feel that someone is listening to them. Today, a friend of mine called me. She's having some mental challenges. She has taken off leave from work. And I sense in my spirit that all she needed was someone to listen to her, find out what is going on, pray with her, and finally suggest some solutions. If she wasn't interested in them, the fact that I had listened actively, sometimes you ask questions. By the time it comes to you giving feedback, the other person has either been satisfied that you've listened to them and they have vented their anger or vented their frustration or spoken out, then they are willing to listen uh, to you. So let's be fully present. If Abigail was not fully present, she would have missed the urgency of the matter that her servant was telling her. If she had not expressed interest in what you are saying, she would not have seen this as a big issue. Because we say communication is almost 70% or 75% body language. The other thing that I will say is listen to understand and not to respond. If Nabal had listened to understand where David was coming from, if he had listened to appreciate the fact that what is happening is serious, he, we probably would have had a different situation from the one that we had. His response would probably have been uh, different in that situation. So what then is the advice after we have listened? In most cases, some situations may need our urgent response. One of my biggest regrets I remember was when one of my mentors at the time when I was on campus fell sick and I took a long time to respond. I took a long time to, uh, to go and visit. By the time I could visit, it was too late. He had died. I remember another situation whereby my niece was malnourished, she was being mistreated by her mother. I, for, I, I took it for granted. I did not immediately intervene. And my niece died from something that if I had intervened seriously and quickly, it would have been a different situation. She most likely would have been alive and well today. Those are two of my regrets. When you think carefully in your past life, when you think of examples of leaders, even within the church setting, most times a leader is at pain and all they needed is someone to listen to them and to listen attentively. Say, I hear you. I've been in situations where people are speaking to me and I say, I hear what you are saying. I hear you. Even when I don't agree with their trend of action, I will say, I hear you. After that, we we'll discuss, we we'll discuss, then I'll, then I'll gauge and say, is this person willing to receive some advice now? And then I'll advise them. Make sure that that is what you do. In conclusion, therefore, don't be an abal who just speaks of the cup without due record or due reconciliation of what he can do, especially when you're talking to the anointed man of God like David was. Number two, when you are wronged, have the emotional intelligence to control. If you can't control, take some time to pause and think carefully before you make an action that can totally destroy many people around you. But number three, have the wisdom to listen, especially to the young people who are speaking to you. You're in a church setting, you're the senior pastor, you're the reverend bishop, archbishop, prophet, whatever you are. God bless you for that. But remember that there are people around you to help you. 
Abigail had a, a servant. David listened to Abigail, even when Abigail would have become, um, uh, you know, um, would have been killed or become a slave uh, to him if he had gone ahead and killed off Nabal. And in when you have been given advice, be like David and say, oh, I repent of the action I was going to take. I repent of that. Let me do as you have advised me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for listening to me. I am very willing to listen to, to, to hear some feedback. And if there are some questions, I would be happy uh, to answer them based on my understanding of the scripture and the topic. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Quick questions for Dan. Dan, that, that was deep. I've never looked at that scripture from an emotional intelligence uh, concept anywhere in near me. We always think about Abigail as, okay, how can you call your husband a fool? And then we argue about that and then everything else. But from an emotional intelligence, circle, no. So that was a new aspect for me. Emotional intelligence is the ability to control emotions and the emotions of those around you. That's the end. Yes, I wrote that down myself. I thought it was just about my emotions. I didn't include the, the emotions of others, but the example of Abigail is very clear, very, very inclusive of the household. So that then that was a very good approach. I've read about emotional intelligence from the world, but the way you the, the scripture you picked for it is just perfect. That was that was just good. Oh, okay. Unmute, let's, let's uh, storm Dan with the question. We know Dan is very bright, but we are also bright people. So let's ask him very hard questions. Um, someone is saying that this was a wonderful message on emotional intelligence, and it is very key to, to life. That's Enoch, Enoch Opoka. He's here from London. So thank you for joining us, Enoch. It's very good to have you. I know Dan must have uh, shared the invite. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. And I think it's your first time. So come back. Come back anytime and bring all the London people. Anyone else who has a question for Dan? Please unmute yourself or type it in the, in the chat. I, don't you think, Dan, ask, I'm still amazed that Abigail says, okay, don't kill my people, but also remember me. It's like she already knew what was going to happen. This man is going to be destroyed and I'll be left here alone. I better ask for a job. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that, that is the power of wisdom. And, and you see, uh, I think women generally have a sixth sense. Uh, of the things that are yet to come. Many times I'm talking with my wife, Claire, and she says, let me give you a picture of what is going to happen, you know, even before it has happened, you know, and, and maybe that can be like the Holy Spirit, <laughs> you know, speaking to you and, and showing you things that are yet to come. Uh, so Abigail knew, you can see that um, her appreciation of who David was, you see, and, and that's why they say she was a woman of understanding and a woman of wisdom. She saw beyond what everybody else was seeing. So she says in verse um, 30, And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you. Mm -hmm. And we lost you there for a second. Your, your internet. Then you're frozen there for a second. Someone is saying Abigail was too bright. I'm giving Dan a chance to come back. I think his internet is... It, 
the one he's using for audio is acting. But who else has a comment on Abigail as we close? And uh, I don't know if... Uh, Sarah, are you at a place where you can talk? And is this Sarah Washington? I want to make sure. Pastor Sarah. And if you're a Zoom user, please identify yourself. Let's know who you are. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Enoch. Sorry, my, my internet has a little bit. <laughs> I wanted to speak a little bit earlier, but yeah. Okay. Um, Wow, wow. What a, a wonderful message, uh, Dr. Daniel Weza and Pastor Judith. Uh, thank you so much for hosting. I've been so much blessed with this wonderful message. I think the church doesn't teach much about emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a subject that it's uh, probably rare. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yet we need it so much in the church. So it's not just about the spiritual things and even emotional intelligence will tell you when to pray when when to act when to like you know what what when to do what you know it will give you the right things to do at the right time so um, been, i've been so much blessed uh, by this wonderful message and uh, thank you so much daniel uh, wow wow i i wish they can share the recording <laughs> for this yeah it message. will be online it will be, be just online. Yeah, please subscribe to EN. And okay. Yeah, please, now that you're sharing, we lost then audio, but do you mind praying for us? Yes. I think we are going to end here. Okay, okay. You want me to pray? Yes, please. please. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for what a wonderful time and message we've had today. Your word says we should not give up the habit of fellowshipping together. Lord, even this, this day, as we fellowship together, we've had and been teaching, uh, learning about emotional intelligence. Your word says that wisdom is the key. And, you know, you said in all our getting, we should get understanding. The Bible says that um, Abigail was a woman of great understanding, oh God. Father, we want to pray this day that each and every one of us, Lord, you shall give us understanding. As your word says that the children of Issachar were people that knew what the Lord wanted them to do in the right time. They were people that had emotional intelligence, Lord. We pray this day that each and every one of us here today, you shall grant us the grace, you can, shall grant us the wisdom, shall grant us the understanding to know the time, to know the season, to know when to act, to know when to pray, to know when to do what, oh God, Father, we pray, my God, that each and every one of us, Lord, you shall awaken this gift, this very important aspect of emotional intelligence, oh God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Enoch, for, for prayer. Thank you for prayer. We went above time today. Because as you had done, had an engagement at the TV, so we gave him a few minutes to to finish that. So I, think thank, I went off. Thank you, Enoch. Thank you. We lost you there also for a second, but thank you for joining us, and hope you. you are doing okay with uh, everyone else. We have Grace also who is in London. Not this wow. Grace is another Grace, but we um, thank you for joining us, everyone. Okay. Um, God bless everyone. So how do we access the link, please, Pastor Judith? How do we access this link, the recording? Timothy is your man. He's going to get in touch with you <laughs> and just hook you up. Okay, all right. Thank you yes. very much. Yeah, and he's already actually well, going to the chat. The, the, the link, this is for YouTube. I'm going to put yeah. also for Facebook. But for okay. the Zoom recording, we are going to put it in the WhatsApp chat. You can follow right. this. The host has been live on YouTube and Facebook, so you can follow through after okay. we finished. But also the Zoom recording, we are going to share it in the chat a few minutes after now. All right, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Too. Thank you. Okay, you. everybody, unmute. Say hello. Say bye. Have a good weekend. We just survived a big storm here, but we thank God power is being restored and uh, internet, but it has been. Uh, more than 200,000 people didn't have power or internet, but 
accept us. So let's keep everyone for one another. Okay, please. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.